Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Very very warm good morning to everyone. I hope all of you are doing good. It is 10 a.m. That means it's time once again to take up today's Hindu newspaper and analyze the most important topics and the most significant articles from today's Hindu newspaper. I hope you have now made it a habit to come here live at 10 a.m. every single day to watch this analysis of the Hindu newspaper since we discuss topics from each and every section of the UPSC syllabus. Before we take a deep dive into what are the important articles in the Hindu newspaper today, there is an extremely important announcement for all of you. On 18th of February, that is Saturday at 6 p.m., we have a live workshop for all of you. In this live workshop, we will be discussing the strategy that you require for the UPSC examination 2024. This is a free of course workshop and this is specifically designed for all those people who are preparing for the 2024 examination. This is a free of course workshop. Anyone can register for this. The link to register is given in the description of the video. Please do remember this workshop will not be on YouTube. This will be on the Baiju's exam prep app. So if you have not downloaded the app so far, do download that so that you can attend this workshop as well. So now let's start and see what exactly are the articles that we have here for you. The first important article that we have here is based on AMR. AMR as you know stands for Antimicrobial Resistance. Now India like many other developing countries right now is facing a problem of antimicrobial resistance. Let's try and understand what exactly is this and what does it actually have to do with India? Now, in India specifically, all of you know, we have a very bad habit. The bad habit is, if any one of us falls ill, we usually avoid going to the doctor. Our first reaction is, we call a friend, we call a family member that you also got ill, you also had fever, what tablet did you take, what capsule did you take, please tell me the name, I will also take that. I can bet in every one of your houses, you have a box of medicines where you would have the medicines that are left over from the last time that the doctor had actually prescribed to you. Every one of us have those boxes where we have half filled capsule strips, half filled tablet strips, right? And whenever we fall ill, whenever we have any problem, the first reaction that we have is we open up that box and we see what is that medicine that we can take. In simple terms, in India, what we do is we self-medicate. Now, there is a lot of problem with self-medication. Self-medication basically means that you are now becoming a doctor yourself. You think, oh, what good are these doctors? They have only studied for 8-9 years. I can do this in 8-9 days. We Google our symptoms and we think whatever the best medicine that we have, we will take that. The next option that we have is we go to the medical store. We asked the chemist, what medicine do you think I should take? The chemist suggests you certain medicine and you take that as well. But at any cost, we avoid going to a doctor. Now that is a very, very dangerous habit that most Indians have. Why is that the case? See, when you take antibiotics without your body requiring antibiotics, that means you are actually increasing the dosage of antibiotics in your body. When you just keep on consuming antibiotics, what happens is your body actually gets so used to those antibiotics that when you actually require those antibiotics to work in your body, to kill the germs, the body will not react to it. In simple terms, your body becomes resistant to antibiotics. Why? Because we think antibiotics is a cure for everything. We keep on taking antibiotics. You all are educated people. You all know. Diseases are not just caused by bacteria. There are diseases that are caused by virus also. For example, when people say I have viral fever. When people say I have viral fever. So viral fever means that it is caused by virus. But even for viral diseases, the ones that are caused by virus, we keep on taking antibiotic. Because it is our assumption that antibiotic will be the solution to everything. The name itself tells you antibiotic will work against bacteria, it will not work against virus. But even then we keep on consuming it. This has become so bad in our country especially that most of our bodies have now become resistant to these antibiotics first. 
second problem this is not the only issue or this is not the only way in which we intake these medicines the food that we eat a lot of non vegetarian food specifically that you eat for example let's take a very simple example if you eat non vegetarian food let's say you eat chicken now when you go and buy chicken from the market they are sold to you in terms of weight okay so the heavier the chicken the costlier the chicken would be the smaller the chicken the lesser will be the size now just imagine if a shopkeeper if a retailer is selling you a chicken in his interest would he want the chicken to be very large or would he want the chicken to be small just imagine that if he is selling you as per the weight of the chicken he would obviously want that the chicken should be very large even if the chicken is not supposed to be that large as compared to what his age is but the retailer would want the chicken to be very large now why does that happen or how does that actually happen the retailer in this case would give a lot of artificial in injections to the chicken a lot of antibiotics are then filled up in the chicken so that they can swell and the body can increase in size so that they can actually get a better price here so the food that you consume a lot of food also has antibiotics which in turn actually comes into your body so there are various ways in which these antibiotics enter our body when we don't even require it and those who are vegetarians i'm sorry to say but in, even in vegetarian foods we do have a large quantity of antibiotics that is artificially injected into them just to increase the growth just to ensure that the vegetables grow at a faster pace in a smaller amount of time so that is again a problem third issue if you have traveled abroad or if you have friends or family who lives in other countries you can ask them also in india you can go to medical store and you can ask for almost any medicine and they will give it to you in very few medical stores you will actually see the chemist or the pharmacist actually asking you for a proper prescription you will not really find most of many cases in india where you will see that the medicines are not given to you without the doctor's prescription basically in india in simple terms every medicine is considered as otc otc means over the counter every medicine is considered as an over the counter medicine which is not the case which should not be the case you go to us you go to european countries you cannot get any medicine without the doctor's prescription they will only give you that medicine or only that quantity which is mentioned by the doctor and not more than that and that is why india has this problem as well now all these things combine meaning that most of the indians unfortunately have developed antimicrobial resistance now the problem here would be that when you actually require the antibiotics to work in your body against a certain disease they will not work now the problem here is it is not easy to invent new antibiotics in the past there have been new antibiotic that have been invented of higher order but it takes years and years and years of research to actually bring up a new antibiotic in fact right now there are people in the world who are resistant to all the levels of antibiotics that are available let me repeat there are people who are right now resistant means their body will not actually uh, have reaction to any of the antibiotics that are available that is also called as multi drug resistant multi drug resistant means your situation has become so bad that your body is not giving you a positive reaction to any of the antibiotics that is why right now it has become increasingly difficult to cure diseases such as pneumonia tuberculosis blood poisoning etc because the antibiotics do not really work because your body has got so used to it as a result of which obviously people are getting more and more time in the hospitals you are spending more money the recovery is delayed there are major surgeries that are required all of these have actually been the outcome of antimicrobial resistant now this is a problem not just in india but in most of the developing nations because the factors that we discussed that is medicines being readily available people avoid going to doctors now you can also see in your own family do you actually go to doctor as often as you should when you fall ill the first reaction in the families is almost never to visit a doctor and there are various reasons for that some people may just be scared but mostly it is about the expense many people think why to go to a doctor it's expensive oh i know the best 
my mother fell ill, my brother fell ill, my friend fell ill, whatever they did, I will do the same. However, that will not work on you. If you have fever, doesn't really mean the fever is the same kind of a fever that your friend had. Maybe your friend had some other symptom, maybe he had some other disease and it cannot be the same for you as well. And that is why a lot of people avoid going to doctors and usually self-prescribe or self-medicate. In 2019, as per the article, about 49.5 lakh human deaths were because of this problem. Means close to 50 lakh people died because there was no antibiotic that was working on their body. Because their bodies were so used to those antibiotics that they used to take even when their body did not need that. There was a study conducted by SEMR in 2022. This study said resistance level increases from 5% to 10% every year for a lot of antimicrobials. When you say antimicrobials, basically antibiotic, antiviral, all of that combined or antifungal, all of that combined, the generic term is antimicrobial. So when you say antimicrobial, that means all these combined. Antibiotics, antivirals, antifungal disease, all these combined will be called antimicrobial. Now, as I told you, this is not just a problem that is in India. There are nations around the world that are facing this kind of a problem. So there was a global conference held recently called the Muscat Conference. This was a third global high level ministerial conference on this only, on antimicrobial resistance. Now again, the idea of this conference was how can we reduce the intake of antibiotics or these kind of medicines when it is not required. So I'll give you an example of what the government of India has been doing. Have you heard about something called the Red Line Campaign? Have you heard about this? Red line campaign. This is something that became very famous a few years back. So those who don't know this, red line campaign was basically a campaign, a kind of a scheme started by the government of India. The government of India said that those medicine strips that have a red line on them. So there are certain medicine strips on which there will be a red line. On those medicine strips where there is a red line that is marked, they should not be sold without a doctor's prescription. So now if you go to a medical store, you ask for a medicine, the pharmacist think, sees that there is a red line on that medicine. He will not be allowed to give it to you unless you show him the doctor's prescription that see the doctor has prescribed for me. If the doctor has prescribed six tablets, only six tablets will be given to you, not more, not less. Nations such as US, etc. are very, very strict with this. They only give you the exact number of medicines that the doctor has prescribed, which is not really the case with India. So the policy has to be more strict, which is not really the case. We have multiple laws, but the policy has not been that strict. The mustard, the mustard conference that we had, the conference had set multiple targets. There were three health targets that were set by different nations. First, reduce that amount of antimicrobials used in every food system by 30 to 50 percent as I told you not just in meat products but in agricultural products also we have a lot of antimicrobials that are used to enhance their growth before time. Second to eliminate the use in animals and food products of antimicrobials that are medically important for human health. So those antibiotics that we anyways have to consume at least let's not use those antibiotics with the animals also and Ensure that by 2030, at least 60% overall antibiotic consumption is of WHO access group of antibiotics. As you know, WHO releases base a list of antibiotics called the access list. Access list basically is a set of those antibiotics which the WHO prescribes or which the WHO advises to the countries around the world. So every few months you will see an access list that is released by WHO, it has a lot of antibiotics. WHO tells these antibiotics or these medicines should be available over the counter. These ones should not be allowed to be sold easily. This is how the WHO actually comes up with this kind of list. So these are the main objectives or the main target that the countries had set for themselves. Now, as I told you earlier, the numbers are very, very scary because just imagine when we fall ill, our first reaction is, okay, we'll go to doctor, doctor will give us a medicine and we will be cured, right? Now imagine if you fall ill, the doctor gives you medicine, the medicine is just not working on you. Why? 
because your body already has consumed so much antibiotics and it has gotten used to it your body now thinks this is a food their body is not reacting the germs are not reacting to it the germs think this is a food that you eat every single day so why do i have to be scared of this and that is why the antimicrobial resistance of very high level is a very very scary proposition because the scientific community is trying to search for new antibiotics but people are fast consuming all of that and that is why we have to make it very 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 difficult to people to actually buy those medicines the government of india as i told you earlier also has made certain provisions there is a red line campaign there are also antibiotics of different categories there is something called h1 drug for example those drugs that cannot be sold to you over the counter there are drugs or when i say drugs I mean medicine when you go to medical stores you essentially have to submit a photocopy of a prescription but all of these are usually not followed very strictly all of us know there is a medical store nearby your house where you go and take any medicine because you have family relations with them so that is why because it is not very strict the problem still exists and the problem has become even bigger by the time now as i told you there are policies that the government of india has launched earlier in 2017 the government of india launched national action plan on antimicrobial resistance this was a 2017 policy to raise awareness about this to ensure that it becomes very difficult for people to consume antibiotics when they did not require it but again these policies are more on paper and lesser on ground now if you go to who website the who website gives you this data about antimicrobial resistance and they tell you what are the main causes for it for example they tell you over prescribing of antibiotics over prescribing means sometimes what happens is some doctors also see again i am not blaming anyone but you have to understand that doctors also are of different types there are some doctors who are experts of their field very experienced they know how much medicine you require how much medicine you do not require then there are some doctors who just want to be safe want to be safe means they think that you require three tablets only but let me write five medicines or five tablets so that i am very sure that the germ is out of your body this does happen with certain doctors unfortunately that they want to play safe so they over prescribe the medicine to you they know that the dosage will be only three uh, tablets but they'll give you four tablets they'll give you five tablets just to make sure that your body is essentially cured out of it that means over prescribing of antibiotics that also is a problem patients not finishing their treatment can also be a problem if you don't consume the entire dose you just take it in very small doses as one tablet here one tablet there that also becomes a problematic thing and your body doesn't understand that this is a medicine that the germs should be scared of overuse of antibiotics in livestock fish farming all these problems become source of why antimicrobial resistance is becoming a big 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 problem now as i said earlier the government of india has taken certain steps we discussed about the red line campaign we also discussed about the national program on amr containment so antimicrobial containment program was launched back in 2012 it was not very successful that is why in 2017 we launched the national plan on amr to raise awareness to make it more strict for the medical stores to just sell any medicine that they want we also have the amr surveillance and research network to capture trends means to see in which part of the city a lot of antibiotics are being sold what can be the reason that in one city so many antibiotics are being sold in some other city antibiotics are not being sold so there are a lot of trends that you can see then you can see okay this is a city where a lot of antibiotics are being sold maybe the doctors of this city need to change their practice so that thing can be done through research and collection of data we also have amr research and international collaboration india has collaborated with multiple nations i'll give you a couple of examples for example icmr that is indian council of medical research they collaborated with research council of norway in the field of antimicrobial resistance in 2017 we have also coordinated with germany as a part of indo german collaboration for research on amr so these are some of the initiatives that we have taken in this regard hopefully this will bring in a change on ground but because india has such a huge population 
bringing any change on the ground is a very gradual process and it remains to be seen whether it actually results in something good in the coming years. This was the first write-up that we want to discuss. Let me take up a couple of questions and then we will go ahead. Muskan is saying, whatever you inform this guy, but today we hear cases regarding false practices of doctors. They are giving high dose even if problem is cured by low dose. Yes, so as I told you, this is not... See, when the doctors prescribe more doses than what is required, it can be because of two reasons. First reason, as I told you, the doctors want to be very safe. Even if you require three tablets, let they let you have five tablets. The second is, there is a problem of even the doctors now having something called sales target. So medical companies, pharma companies, a lot of them go to doctors, they give them targets that if you write 10 boxes of our medicine in a month to patients, then we will give you this gift in return. This is a very common practice. It might seem very odd to you, but a lot of doctors get foreign trips, they get a lot of big gifts, etc. When they get certain targets on the company that you have to write these many medicines and they do that. A lot of them do that, which is again a cause of concern here. I'll take one more question. Uh, what is super bug? The Pankar is asking. Super bug again is a kind of bug or it's a kind of virus or bacteria on which no antibiotic, no antimicrobial will actually work. So a bug that is so evolved, that has so mutated that no medicine will work on that, that is called a super bug. <clears throat> okay, I'll take one last question from uh, Vaishna. What is the difference between antimicrobial resistance and multi-drug resistance? So basically antimicrobial resistance, as you understood, when your body becomes resistant to antibiotics. Now what happened is, as human beings started becoming resistant to antibiotics, scientists discovered higher order of antibiotics, more stronger antibiotics, then even more stronger, then even more stronger. So even right now, there are different levels of antibiotics. When one that is very weak, then strong, then stronger, strongest, etc. When your body becomes resistant to all the levels, when your body becomes resistant to all the levels, that is called multi-drug resistant. That is called multi-drug resistant. For example, if you go and see a patient who has tuberculosis, tuberculosis medicine differs from patient to patient depending upon whether you have developed multi-drug resistance or not. If you have developed multi-drug resistance, then your medicine would have to be different. So that is how it is different. Let's go ahead then. The second item that we have is about India's Sri Lankan refugees. Now, what exactly is this issue? Uh, unfortunately, we don't talk a lot about Sri Lankan refugees in India. We talk about the Rohingyas in India. We talk about the other refugees that are coming to India from other parts of the world, let's say Afghanistan, etc. But unfortunately, we do not really talk a lot about the Sri Lankan refugees. Now, the idea of Sri Lankan refugees is simple. As you know, for multiple decades, Sri Lanka had a deadly civil war. When they had a civil war, the Tamil population of Sri Lanka, a lot of them who are of who were of Indian origin, a lot of Tamilians in Sri Lanka started to leave their country because they wanted, they, they were fearing that they would be killed by the Sri Lankan armed forces. A lot of them left Sri Lanka to safeguard their life. Just like what happened in East Pakistan back then. Now, these people who left Sri Lanka, a lot of them settled in India. A lot of them came to Tamil Nadu specifically. Tamil Nadu being very close to them. Tamil Nadu also has historical ties with Sri Lanka. So a lot of these refugees were then settled in Tamil Nadu and they were called the Sri Lankan refugees. Now when the Sri Lankan refugees were settled in India, India at that point of time said, okay, we will intake all the refugees, no problem, we'll give them food, we'll give them uh, uh, clothes and place to live, etc. But the goal was that ultimately, these Sri Lankan refugees would have to be resettled in Sri Lanka only. That was the end goal. That ultimately the Sri Lankan refugees would have to be settled back in Sri Lanka only. That has not happened. As per the author, both the governments are now not working towards this. The Sri Lankan government should accept that yes, these are our citizens. They should be allowed to settle back in Sri Lanka. And the Indian government should also make arrangements for that. But that is not happening, unfortunately. The Sri Lankan refugees thus, although they do have certain rights here in India, they do get ration, etc. But for them to find a job in India, 
it's very difficult for them to actually have most of the rights it's very difficult for them to get most of the government rights government documents so the Sri Lankan refugees are now stuck in between the country that they had left is now more peaceful so they can go back and settle but the governments are not taking any action the country where they are that is India they have given them certain rights but not a lot of rights so they are stuck in between somehow and people don't talk about them because again our focus mainly is on the other refugees that have come in from other countries if you look at the Ministry of Home Affairs data that data says that 3 lakh 4,269 Sri Lankan refugees entered India between July 1983 and August 2012 they were given a lot of support by the government but again they have not been settled back as I told you earlier as well there was an attempt or the attempt was eventually these Sri Lankan refugees would have to be taken back to Sri Lanka and settled there in their houses in their lands that they originally had but the progress on this front has been extremely extremely slow a lot of the refugees don't want to go back to Sri Lanka because they think that their life would still be in danger they think that they would still face discrimination in Sri Lanka as you know when Sri Lanka got independence from British, Sri Lanka had a Sinhalese population that were mainly Buddhist and there was a Tamil population of Sri Lanka. Sinhalese were the majority group, Tamil were the minority group. Now amongst Tamils also, they are considered to be two types of Tamils. One who are originally Sri Lankans, one who are Indian origin Tamils. Indian origin means See, <clears throat> when the British were in Sri Lanka, they started a lot of tea plantation in Sri Lanka. So to work or to have workers who would actually be employed on the tea plantations, what the British did was, they actually took a lot of Indians, mainly from Tamil Nadu, from Madras presidency of that time to Sri Lanka. So a lot of Indians, originally from the Madras presidency, were taken to Sri Lanka, settled there so that they can work there. Now, when their generations go on, third generation, fourth generation, they are born in Sri Lanka. So they are Sri Lankans but they are of Indian origin. So a lot of Indian origin Tamil population was in Sri Lanka at the time of their independence. When they got independence, Sinhalese population who was the majority thought that these Indian origin Tamil should go back. They don't belong here, they will eat up our jobs, they will take up our land, they should go back. Obviously, if someone is born in Sri Lanka, if their third, fourth generation are born in Sri Lanka, you can't expect all of them to go back all of a sudden. And go back where? They are Sri Lankan citizens only. When Sri Lankan Tamils did not leave the country, when Indian origin Tamils did not leave the country, it led to a situation where the Sri Lankan government itself started making laws that were against the Tamil population. Sinhalese was made the official language. Anyone speaking Tamil language was getting a very hard time even to get admission into schools. The children were not being admitted to school. They were not getting any jobs. Even their right to vote was taken away in many cases. A lot of these things happened. And even then, when most of the Tamil population did not leave Sri Lanka, eventually there was an operation started by Sri Lankan army where Sri Lankan army started killing Tamil origin people. And this is what led to the beginning of the civil war. Because when there was a lot of killing of the Tamil population, they also organized different groups that we will fight back. And this led to the initial beginning of the civil war. One of the groups that became very famous later was the LTTE or Litte as you call it. Litte was one of the groups that emerged as a result of all these atrocities that were imposed on the Tamil population. So LTTE and other smaller groups emerged to fight against the Sri Lankan army. LTTE was the largest of those groups. Now, if you look at Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan government says that we have been working towards rebuilding those areas. If you look at the map of Sri Lanka, you will see it is in the northern part of Sri Lanka that most of the Tamil population resided. In the northern part, they have a province called the Jaffna province. The Jaffna province in the northern part of Sri Lanka, this is where most of the Tamil population used to reside. It's very close to Tamil Nadu, if you can see in, on the map, it's very, very close to Tamil Nadu. So, because this area was the hub of most of the Tamil population, there was no development in this area earlier because the government of Sri Lanka never spent any money there. However, things have changed. 
Sri Lankan government says that we have spent about three and a half billion dollars to now rebuild east and northern provinces and bring in more development in those areas. But in the past few years, again, the situation has changed. As you know, Sri Lanka again is going through a very tough economic crisis. It started with the Easter bombings. There was an Easter, uh, as you know, the Easter festival. On the day of the Easter, there were bomb attacks on multiple churches in 2019. Then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Because of all of that, since Sri Lanka's economy has been hit, the government of Sri Lanka does not have enough money now to spend on development of these areas. So development activities in the northern part of Sri Lanka that were going on earlier have now stopped. These refugees who are in India, as I told you, many people say the government of India should at least try to settle them back in Sri Lanka or if that is not the case, they should give them proper citizenship. Because right now, they are actually stuck in between. They are not official Indian citizens also and they are not even being allowed to go back to Sri Lanka also. So they are kind of stuck in between right now. Most of these refugees are living in Tamil Nadu. Some of them are outside Tamil Nadu also in states such as Odisha, etc. Some of the refugees have gone back. So far about 99,000 refugees have been repatriated to Sri Lanka. So about 1 lakh have gone back, but a lot of these refugees still remain in India because the government on both the sides have not been able to resettle the dispute. Sri Lanka says right now, we don't have our own money to run our own economy. How can we intake more people? India says that it has been a long time. You should now take back the refugees and it has to be your responsibility because we have already signed a deal for that. But so far, no solution has been found. And the author here is bringing the attention to this only that while we talk a lot about the refugees in northern part of the country, refugees coming in the form of Rohingyas, refugees coming from other parts, but we do not really talk about the Sri Lankan refugees. As you can see here, the government of India does take certain efforts in this regard. September 2022, for example, Sri Lankan government appointed a committee to facilitate return of refugees in Tamil Nadu. But again, all these things are mainly on paper. Many of these refugees don't even want to go back because they think again that they don't have any land in Sri Lanka now. They will not be able to get any jobs. But a solution has to be found here between the two sides. Also, there have been certain judicial interventions in this regard which I wanted to share. Judicial intervention means there have been certain instances where the Supreme Court and the High Courts have also spoken in this regard. There are a couple of very important things. One, as per a recent judgment, even the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019, that would also be applicable to Sri Lankan refugees. So, the Madras High Court has said that the Citizenship Amendment Act should apply to Sri Lankan refugees as well. As you know, the Citizenship Amendment Act originally did not have the name of Sri Lanka. It only had the name of Bangladesh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But the court has said even Sri Lankan refugees should be given citizenship under that if they have come into India before the cutoff date. Not just this, the Madras High Court has even said that it is a failure of the two governments, India and Sri Lankan government, that they have not been able to settle the dispute. Because of this, the people in between should not suffer. The people in between, they should have their fundamental right under Article 21. The two governments should solve this matter as soon as possible. There have been other examples of nations around the world that have ultimately given citizenship to refugees. We have seen Sri Lanka, oh, sorry, we have seen USA also, we have seen other countries such as Brazil who have realized that when the refugees come to your country and they stay there for a long time, ultimately you have to give them citizenship. And that is what is happening in other countries also. And that should happen in India as well. The next article that we have here is from Indian Polity, a topic that has been in the news multiple times. Whenever we have new governors being appointed, you have the same kind of topic coming again. You saw just a few days back, the government of India reshuffled a lot of governors. Some states have a new governor, some governors resigned, some were transferred from one state to the other state. Now, while the president of India appoints the governors on the advice of the central government, we know that the central government usually wants these people only as a governor who are close to the central government. 
but whenever such appointments take place we usually have some kind of a controversy about certain people who are appointed this time around the controversy is about a retired supreme court judge justice s abdul nazir who has been appointed as a governor of andhra pradesh why is that the controversy the controversy is that this judge just retired about one month back from the supreme court so when there is a judge who has just retired one month back from the supreme court and now you appoint the judge as the governor that sends a very wrong message wrong message in the sense that maybe the government had some kind of understanding with the judge that even after you retire we will give you a good job this does not give a good impression and this is what the article is all about that yes it is not illegal as per the constitution of india the judges in india after retirement can take up the job of a governor because governor's post is not considered as an office under the government of india it's an independent constitutional authority however even then we have to understand that even in this case the optics of this decision a judge just getting retired a month back a judge who was a part of an important decision such as the ayodhya mandir land issue even then the judge getting this appointment within a month does not really seem good and this is not the first time that this has happened if you have seen earlier as well retired supreme court judges have been given positions talk about the retired chief justice of india justice ranjan gogoi justice ranjan gogoi was nominated in the rajya sabha by the government of india and the funny part is when justice ranjan gogoi was appointed or nominated in the rajya sabha and people asked him why did you take this post you should not have taken this post you don't do you know what he said he said that i am coming here to bridge the divide between judiciary and legislative he said that i will be the connecting channel between judiciary and legislative i want to do this but if you see the attendance record of justice ranjan gogoi how many days has he come to rajya sabha he hardly comes to rajya sabha his attendance is one of the lowest amongst all the members in the rajya sabha so his idea that i will bring judiciary and legislature closer doesn't really seem to have realized because again his attendance record in the parliament is extremely extremely weak there have been multiple such instances in the past however many judges have criticized this also in 1980 justice v d tulzapurkar made a statement if judges start sending bouquets and congratulatory letters to political leaders in assumption that they will get high offices it will reduce people's confidence in the judiciary which is absolutely correct just imagine what will the common people think a supreme court judge getting retired as soon as the judge getting retired the judge is now coming in the governor's position governor's position with the government of india wants to run on its own all that does not really give a good impression one more thing here let's not blame the present government because whenever we think these kind of issues come to picture we assume that it is the present government only but that is not the case all governments irrespective of whichever political party they are from all governments have had a track record of doing the same the congress party when they were in power they also tried to influence the judiciary in fact it was a congress government that started this idea and there is a phrase for it that is called uh, basically judges as committee head so basically the idea or the loophole that the congress government had found was in the 1970 1980s the congress government knew that after the judges retire officially you cannot give them a government job that is banned so government knew that we have to appoint so many committees so many commissions so let us make the judges head of certain committees or commissions why because when a judge becomes a head of a committee or a commission they get a lot of very high salary for this in fact a lot of times the salary that the judges get as a head of certain commissions is more than what they were getting as a supreme court judge that is a big loophole that the government finds out that is why you see most of the committees of the governments are actually presided over by judges only retired judges because again that is a kind of understanding that they have that okay you retire we'll make you the head of certain committees so this is not the first time that the judges are being influenced by offering them something this committee thing has happened in the past as well ideally it should not happen again this is not illegal 
this is not illegal but this is certainly unethical as you would have read in ethics also not everything that is ethical has to be legal it is not illegal this is perfectly legal because a governor's office is not considered as an office under the government of India but this is certainly unethical you know there are a lot of provisions given to ensure independence of judges in India their salary for example the charge expenditure that means it is not voted by the parliament of India it cannot be reduced during their tenure not just this their removal is extremely extremely difficult you cannot remove a supreme court or a high court judge without the parliament starting the process the parliament passing the bill by special majority it is extremely extremely difficult and that is why so far no supreme court or high court judge has been removed so on one hand the constitution does give certain provisions to ensure that the judges can work independently without the government's fear but the judges also know if they are in supreme court after 65 years of age they will retire so they are thinking from long term perspective right after retirement what will I do I don't want to sit at home and just solve sudoku I want to do something else in that case this is where the government find out these loopholes either make them head of committee commissions make them governors etc the next article that we have here is about a concept that you keep on hearing this is called windfall tax now what exactly do you mean by a windfall tax windfall tax is a tax imposed by the government when the government believes companies are making a lot of profit all of a sudden without anything that they did meaning that some external factors change because of which all of a sudden the company is making a lot of profit government says now we will impose extra tax on you let's take a simple example let us assume there is an oil refining company okay let's say the oil company usually buys oil at hundred dollar per barrel okay all of a sudden something happened in the international market and the price is reduced to fifty dollars per barrel if the price reduced to almost half in the international market obviously the profit of the company will increase drastically the company will not reduce the selling price they will sell it to the same price for example right now you see so many news stories that India is buying cheap oil from Russia we are buying cheap oil from Russia time and time again the European countries start saying that India should not do this but do you think petrol or diesel has become cheaper no it has not become cheaper don't you think that we should also say if we are buying cheap oil from Russia make the petrol cheaper but that is not happening we are getting petrol and diesel at the same price that we were getting earlier even now when the government is buying at a cheaper price we are still getting it at the same price why because the end price doesn't really change so what the government does government puts in extra tax on this margin this is called windfall tax the windfall tax is imposed when an extra gain has been made by the company without any decision of the company due to some external factors that have changed this windfall tax is usually in crude oil crude products only because their price fluctuates on Feb 3 government hiked the windfall profit tax on export of diesel aviation turbine fuel etc because again we are buying it at a cheaper price and the government also wants to earn more money in between this cost difference that has occurred now in fact as per the official numbers of the government in the ongoing financial year ongoing financial year meaning the year that will end on 31st of March it is assumed that the government will earn extra 25,000 crore from this windfall tax windfall tax is over and above any tax that the government usually imposes it is extra tax that is imposed when the government thinks companies making a lot of profit because in the international market the prices have reduced the government keeps on changing this tax the government keeps on reviewing this time and time again this is usually reviewed in a couple of weeks so every couple of weeks they review the taxes they review they see if the tax has to be continued or not now as I discussed the reason why windfall taxes have been imposed this time around is because of the Ukraine Russia war because of which we are seeing that Russia has to now sell the oil at a cheaper price to India 
the example is in the numbers of ONGC. If you look at ONGC right now, until September, the end of September. Why September? Because September is usually, if you look at the financial year, September is considered as the middle. So September means first half. In the first half of financial year, ONGC's profit was already 28,000 crore. Just imagine that. And their last complete year's profit was 40,000 crore. Now imagine, ONGC last complete year had a 40,000 crore profit. This financial year, even in half of the year, they have already made 28,000 crore as a profit. Why? Because the oil prices reduced for them due to the tips from Russia. This is why the Indian government is saying that you should not have all the pie alone. We will also come in, we will also take a piece of this cake. Let us also gain certain profit out of it. This is what happens. Now, do you think the oil companies are happy with this? Obviously not. Oil companies are not happy with this. Oil companies do not want this. Why? Because oil companies want their own money in their own pocket. The government says, and <coughs> this is not just with India. The government and other countries also that put windfall taxes, they say the money that will, we will make from here, we will invest that money in sustainable energy. So because we have to go towards green energy in the future, because we have to go towards sustainable energy in the future, we have to use that money. Now, the decision is very simple. The government has to decide. There are two things that the government can do. If the government is seeing that the prices of the fuel are decreasing, there are two options. One option that the government has is reduce petrol prices for consumers. The government can ask the companies to reduce petrol prices for consumer. That is one option. And the second option is windfall tax means increase government revenue. The government right now has chosen the second one. Rather than reducing the price of petrol, the government is saying let people pay the same money that they were paying earlier. They can afford it. Rather, we will fill in our pocket, we will fill in our purse and use that money in other government schemes. So that depends on how the government will actually un understand this topic. If election would have been near, you might have seen the government taking up the first option. The first option was to reduce the prices. But since the elections right now, at least the big elections are not near. So the government thinks... Let the people pay what they are paying. Let us go ahead and put more taxes so that we can use that money for other government schemes. Now, there are certain issues also with windfall taxes. First, there is uncertainty in the market because windfall taxes change, can change after every two weeks. Government analyzes the rates every two weeks and then they change the taxes. So there is uncertainty in the pricing pattern. These are populist in nature, meaning that it depends on the government of the day. When they want to impose, when they don't want to impose. As I told you, when the elections are near, they will not impose it. When the elections are far away, then they might impose it. So it gives a lot of discretionary power to the government. It reduces future investment. Why? Because you are not allowing the oil companies to earn more money. When you are not allowing the oil companies to earn more money, then the problem here is, how will they invest more money in new technology? So that also becomes an issue. Oil companies are saying that we also should get more money so that we can increase our technology. We can give you better, cleaner fuel. But the government doesn't allow it. And it is not defined properly. Meaning, how much tax will be imposed in the name of windfall tax for how long? It is all in the government's discretion. Government decides how they want to go ahead with it. Government does not really have any specific limit. They can put whatever windfall tax that they want without anyone stopping them. That is a big, big, big issue. The next article that we have here is about India's Mental Health Care Act of 2017. Why is this article written? The act is an old act 2017. The reason why this act has been written is because recently there is an NHRC report, National Human Rights Commission report that has come out. They have given a report that if you look at those mental health care institutions set up by the government, you, many people call them mental hospitals, many people call them mental asylums, etc. But the correct name is mental health care institutions. 
So as per the NHRC, the mental health institutions running across the country are not treating their patients well. In fact, they are actually treating the patients thinking that they have gone mad. Many of them are restricted from movement. They are not even allowed to move from one place to the other. Many of them do not even have the most basic rights that are available to everyone. And that is why the issue is that the mental health care facilities across the country need to improve. The NHRC has said that the mental health care act of 2017 has to be implemented properly. If you look at this act, the mental health care act of 2017 that talks about the fact that government should provide proper facilities for their treatment, including rehabilitation homes, sheltered accommodations, <coughs> supported accommodations, physical restraints, etc. should not be allowed, no chaining, etc. No electrical conclusive therapy should be allowed. All these things that are considered as torture should not be allowed. The things that you see in movies that someone goes to mental hospital, then people are chained, people are then uh, forcefully fed in their mouth. All that is prohibited under this act. As per the act, the people who are suffering from any mental illness deserve the same kind of rights as other people. That is what the Mental Health Care Act actually talks about. As per the article, there are a lot of challenges that we are facing. A lot of these provisions of the act have not been implemented. For example, 36.25% of these users were found to be living for one year or more in these facilities, meaning that a lot of times, even those who have been cured, even those who should be let go now, even then the patients are not released. Now, please understand this problem here. The problem here is, let's say there is a patient who is admitted to this mental health care facility. For that patient to be released, the doctor has to give the certificate that the patient is now cured. Now what happens is because of ulterior motives of the doctor, because the doctor or the institutions want to earn more money, they want more patients. So rather than relieving their patients, they don't give a report that the patient is fine. They keep the patient so that they can keep earning money. If the patient says, I am fine now, they will say, oh, every patient says I am fine, but let the doctor decide. That is where the issue starts. That a lot of times, their doctors do not give them reports to be released. Secondly, in a lot of states, these facilities have not even been set up by the government. The government has not given them enough budget because understand, <clears throat> in India, this is not our priority. How many times in a day do you think about the problem that mentally ill people are facing? We think about poverty, we think about hunger, we think about population problem, but we don't even think about the fact that there may be a problem in India where mental health care facilities are not up to the mark. That is why the government does not really give them a lot of budget. Government has not really made it a priority to ensure that these kind of acts are implemented properly. The government of India has taken certain initiatives in this regard. Let me share them with you. We have the national mental health program to treat those who are facing from some mental diseases. <clears throat> we also have the national mental health program that has been running since 1982. At the district level also, it was launched in 1996 to treat those patients, give them primary health care facilities at the district level. We have the mental health act that we just discussed. We even have the Kiran helpline that was launched in 2020. In this helpline, you can have a toll free number. If you are facing certain stress, anxiety, you want to talk to someone, you want to talk to an expert, you don't know how to go to a doctor, call on this Kiran helpline number and they will help you out. These are some of the initiatives that the government has taken. We also have the Mano Darpan initiative. It is an initiative by the Ministry of Education that gives psychological support to students, teachers, their family members, etc. so that they don't fall into any kind of stress. We also have the MANAS mobile app. MANAS stands for Mental Health and Normalcy Augmentation System. Again, this is an app where the government of India tries to ensure mental well-being of as many people as possible. These are some of the initiatives that the government of India has already taken in this regard. These were the important articles we want to discuss on today's Hindu newspaper. These are a couple of practice questions that you have here for you. Number one, 
Why has the government failed to resettle the Sri Lankan refugees in Tamil Nadu over the decades? Identify the possible remedies for the same. Second, windfall taxes may be an attractive idea in the short term, but do more harm than good in the long term. Do you agree? Critically analyze. Both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each. I'll take a couple of questions. Dhananjay is asking how government earns money from retroal bonds. Government does not earn money from retroal bonds. Retroal bonds are for the donations to be made to the companies. Then one last question, corporate tax or windfall tax, no, these are not the same. Corporate tax is something that will always be applied. Windfall tax is dependent on certain situations. Windfall tax is over and above the corporate tax. Perfect. This brings us to the end of this episode of the Hindu analysis. I'll see you tomorrow, same time, 10 a.m. Have a good day ahead. Bye-bye. Jai Hind.